Hi, everyone, and welcome to our usual Sunday talk within the Nine Sided Circle. I am your host, Noor Kyle. And I am her faithful sidekick, Mushtaq Ali. Yes, and thank you for joining us, whether you're here live or watching on the replay. Some of you who are here live have even joined us for our other talk, which takes place every third Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. Pacific time, which means here you are again. This is our third Sunday. So if you missed that one this morning, but you'd like to join us next month, Keep that in mind. It's a great alternative time for the people who can't make our usual time, which is now at 6.30 p.m. Pacific time. Other than that, our YouTube spiel. Well, if you'd like to support us, there are several ways you can do that. The most easy one, if you're watching on YouTube, is to subscribe to our channel, of course. And you can also like our videos you can leave comments whether they're for us or in dialogue with other people who are in the comments or in response to the video itself all of that is lovely and you can even share our videos with people you think might be interested or as mushtaq says even people who won't be interested so that you can drive them up the wall yeah go go you good job so other than that Another way you can support us, of course, is to join our email list, which you'll find in the description, along with our Facebook page and group. And we have a couple of donation links, if that's something that speaks to you. Because as I said this morning, that helps us keep the lights on and keeps us doing the work that we do here with you. And that's why we're here tonight. Yes. Why are we here tonight? Uh, okay, so tonight we're here to talk about our path in a way. And our path as it relates to you, our community. Yeah, some of you may or may not know that this month is our six-year anniversary of doing this. We have been churning out videos like this for six long years. Why the hell are we doing this? Yeah, I don't know, but some of you have been weird enough to stick around with us for just about all of these six years. That's pretty amazing. And we, from our hearts, really appreciate that. And for those of you who have come along in the years since, you are also a meaningful part of our community. And we really benefit from having all of you present with us. Hmm. Because this is really not just about me and Mushtaq. We have known that since the beginning. Yeah, it's actually is... hardly anything about you I mean, and I. We do the, the admin, I guess, yeah. and the facilitating. But other than that, what really helps us thrive is what you all bring to the table. Yeah. So what we've done over the last six years is to create a body of knowledge that is free for the taking for anyone they can go on and they have three years of videos blathering about god knows what three years six years? six years yeah that's right well three years of blathering three years of making sense <laughs> that's how i always figure it um and we're doing this for a specific reason and that reason has a lot to do with how the world is right now. For those of you who have been students of history, you may have noticed that history goes in cycles. We just tend to repeat the same shit over and over again. And one period of the, the human cycle is Mongols, right? The Mongols always show up. Yeah, and when they show up, it's disastrous for humanity. And the, the first real, bit, well, we had the Romans. They, they were not totally disastrous, but they were kind of disastrous. Uh, yeah, you know, small tyrants. The Mongols were big tyrants. They completely disrupted history as we knew it. 
the Nazis are another one. Uh, Nazis were bad for the health of humanity. And we're back in another one of these cycles. But 75 years later, uh, we're moving towards another Mongol invasion. Don't know exactly when, but civilization is going through upheavals right now. And it's liable to not get any better anytime soon. Within our tradition, when that happens, we work to preserve the teaching. And the way we preserve the teaching is, uh, there's a couple of ways, but the, the one that affects us the most right now is we spread it everywhere. We don't hide it, we spread it. We make it available. And so for the last six years and the next six years, we are going to continue adding to the body of knowledge that is available on this channel. And we're now that we have built this up, we're going to take it and move it into other channels where... Um, so to speak. Yeah, there, there are other methods of delivery that... Uh, will be useful and help preserve it. We'll probably even do some some dead tree editions of our teachings. Yeah. Good use yeah. for dead trees. And so that is one of the, the reasons that we exist, is to put this out here to go, hey, y'all want enlightenment? You may not be able to find a teacher. You might have to do this while you are hitting <clears throat> the bad guys. And here is an entire methodology methodology by which you can work on yourself. And we've done it so that nothing is hidden. We are not obfuscating anything. We are not hiding things behind metaphor. We are not not doing any kind of secret stuff behind. Well, we have some secret stuff behind the the closed door, but that's a different thing. Um, and we have not created a paywall for this. And we do this because the world is going to need it. Now, along with that, what we really need is people who have the capability of transmitting this information themselves. This is tricky, but um, as we've said for years, we train teachers. That's, that's our job. That's what we do. And this does not mean that you have to join the nine-sided circle and have a nine-sided circle certificate saying that you can go out and teach. Franchise. Yeah, we are not going to franchise you. Learn it, share it to the best of your ability. That's the rule. Um, and don't put the truth behind a paywall because God will get mad at you if you do that. I have this on good authority. So does that mean that you can't get paid? No, but it means make the teaching available. So in the next six years, we are going to be concentrating more and more on how to teach this material as well as how to do it. It'll be two separate lines of this. Uh, and there's a, a few ways we're going to do it. Um, you won't end up with a diploma unless you want one. I can make one up for you. I've been a graphic artist for most of my life. I can design a diploma. Will it mean anything? No. The only thing that means anything is, can you do the work and can you teach the work? No piece of paper will change that. So we are in an organization that you don't have to join. Thoughts? Um, thoughts. Well, I think, you know, this is still... <laughs> Adrian wants a diploma. 
and James is vibing with our whole, you know, these are times where things need to get serious in terms of really collectively applying ourselves towards uh I grew I grew up in the eighties, so there was lots of doomsday paranoia. So perhaps that's just my paranoia. Yeah. Oh good, great. Yeah. <laughs> and we aren't talking doomsday. This mm. is a cycle that happens over and over again. Humanity will in all likelihood survive it. Humanity survived the Mongols. They came in, they destroyed whole civilizations. They killed millions and millions of people. And we survived. But, you know, it wasn't any fun and we lost a lot. What did we lose with the Mongol invasions? I don't know if this is kind of obvious, but we lost stable social structures and yeah. stable social structures. People can grow inside stable structures with more efficiency than outside of them, perhaps. I mean, I don't think hard times guarantees you're going to be wise or strong. You may just be broken. Um, that's the first thing that comes to my mind. Yeah, we lost that. We lost libraries. We lost vast libraries in the Middle East. When the Mongols invaded uh, several of the cities that they invaded in Central Asia, they burned them to the ground. So knowledge is lost during the, the Mongol cycle. Same thing happened with the Nazis. Out of the 6 million people that they murdered in the concentration camps, how many of them were great scholars of one sort or another? Well, a lot of them. A lot of them. Yeah. You know, and not just scholars of Torah, but Kabbalah and you know, all of the philosophers, all of these, these kind of people get killed off during these times if they're not careful. Adrian mentions uh, the Reconquista. Yeah, the Reconquista was another one. That was that was like Mongol light. Because well, of... they say that the books were burning Granada for three months straight. Yeah, but they also preserved a bunch of books. Yeah, you know, because of the Reconquista, Europe got the, the Greek philosophers and mathematicians again. Um, they found these works in the libraries. They had uh, Jewish conversos uh, translated from Arabic into Latin. And all of a sudden we have Aristotle and Plato and Archimedes and all of these guys that, that Europe had lost. There is a conversation we had some time ago, and uh, and it adds to other information I got from other side, which is the Mongol invasion actually changed the axis of the teaching from Central Asia to Turkey and the yes. things. And uh, a part of the conversation was how how the teaching was ch changing the axis against uh, against no again towards America, in a way, you know, yeah. in America. South America, yes, please. Yeah, America had a great amount of hope at one point from the 60s and 70s, and we completely blew it. We, we dropped the ball. Um, and I don't know that we'll recover from that. Nancy points out the, the Cultural Revolution was another Mongol invasion. 11 million people were killed during that. Uh, and it was their best and their brightest. In China? In China, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, not to, I mean, we're, you know, I hate to be a doomsayer about this kind of stuff, but, but, because it's not that it's there are hard times during hard times 
it is best to preserve this stuff by making it widely available. And, you know, maybe uh, in a few months, uh, America will become a theocracy. I don't think so, but it's possible. You know, the uh, 2025 plan is a little bit scary. Project 2025? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, we have genocide in the Middle East that everybody is ignoring. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was specifically thinking of the six million Jews that are frequently... But Nancy points yeah. out that in aggregate, it was 11 million lost. Yes. Yeah. Too many. Thank you, Carlos. Yeah, Gitanos. Uh, Ricky Ramos. Oh, Rafik. Rafik, yes. That's right. I actually sent him a, uh, a note earlier this week because we hadn't heard from him. So, here's the question. How can we, in a time of strife and trouble, make sure that people have the opportunity to wake up, to complete themselves, to uh, to become a, a completed human being, an insan al -kama. Um, Carl, do you have your hand up? I'm sorry. Yeah, yes. go for it. Um, to your question, it makes me think of uh, Gurdjieff during World War II and how he helped a lot of people and continued teaching by essentially being invisible. Yeah. And, uh, and, and using his skills to uh find supplies and things like that yeah managed to do it during both world wars to, in different ways but um yeah that's a good example and finally we have published the the talks that he gave during world war ii in paris and they're really quite brilliant, worth reading uh, and seeing how he did things because he was teaching at the risk of his life at that point. Yeah, not that we personally. No, we're not teaching at the like risk. That, but... yeah, no, but they, we, they are now accessible. Yes. Yeah. Do you have a reference for that, like an author? Um, title. I can find one for you and put it up in the forum or right. in the notes here. Um, yes, be, uh, because I hadn't come across anything like that. In, yeah, there's a couple of different recently. ones. Okay, uh, good. And I have them up in my bookcase, but I don't want to crawl up in my bookcase right yeah, now. Yeah, we'll get back to everyone on the forum about that later. Yeah. But uh, thanks, Ian. And someone said in the chat, Nancy asks, how do we get people to want to wake up? Or does that come from within? There is only one surefire way I know of, which is to be awake yourself. If you are awake yourself, then you will attract people to you. You will have a magnetic center that draws people in. And this is no matter what you're doing in the world. 
and Brian runs a gym. And that is a place where people can come and be exposed to interesting ideas in a way that is non-threatening and uh, opens up opportunities to them. Even property management. Even property management, yeah. So the, the way to find people who want to wake up is to be awake mm. yourself. Yeah, totally yeah. serious about this. Yeah. Rafik? Yeah. Did... One second. Okay. Yeah. So it's it's subtle. It's inspiring to people if they experience you as awake. But you're also just by being around people, you have an influence over them that if you are awake is positive. And you don't have to do anything particular necessarily you don't have to preach to people in no, fact it's don't better preach if you to don't. people whatever you do don't preach to people we said preaching to people we aren't preaching we're anti-preaching <laughs> yeah. yeah so you live your life in such a way that uh, people are drawn near to you and they want to know, hey, how come you're so cool? And can I be that way too? And then you can just say, well, you know, years ago, somebody taught me this weird breathing exercise. You might like it. Boom. Boom. So we take a moment to check in with everybody and go, how are you doing with all of this? Don't everybody talk at once. Fine so far. Okay. Thanks, Ian. How about... Yeah, um, I can jump in, if that's okay. What's that? I can jump in. Please. Um, yeah, it is. It's actually where I was having conversation with uh, a group of my friends today about <clears throat> this idea that we talk about here often, this idea of having a circle. Um, and it can be just a group, you know, a group of friends that have the same... Um, this common goal of waking up collectively um, and not necessarily all having to be doing the same things or believing in the same way or all, you know, that kind of stuff. But this common goal of, I like how you put it, Mustafa, completing oneself, right? And it kind of goes with uh, this morning's talk that I missed, uh, but I, I watched it. it was fire. It was amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, I think having having a group of people, having a circle, having um, a dialogue just to l teach and learn. Yeah, Constantly. share ideas. Exactly. That's what comes to yeah. mind from, from this. And that's what we're hoping each of every one of you who is sitting in this this virtual room right now has the opportunity to have a circle forming around them. And it doesn't have to look like a particular thing. It can just be a group of friends. It can be a book club. It can be a thousand different things, a sewing circle. Contact improv group. 
contact improv group. <laughs> and that's actually getting into the Sufi realm. <laughs> uh, just remember a conversation about that the other day. Yeah. So it came to mind. So yeah. It, yeah, it doesn't have to look like any particular thing. It's the impulse behind it. It's the inspiration behind it and what drives it that makes it what it is. Yeah, Rafiq says, I love the way you state that our circle is not centralized. Love that. Yeah, you know, that's important. And if this, if we were doing the usual thing, I would tell everybody that uh, Noor is the guru and she's enlightened. And if you follow her and you're really, really lucky, you might be able to eat some crumbs from her table. But also pay, pay me. Yeah, pay her. But we aren't doing that. She may be all of these things, but we aren't doing that. <laughs> yeah, this is a new way of doing things, and it's the way that it needs to be done now. What was done a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago does not work now. A thousand years ago, when the Mongols were invading Central Asia, there were entirely different resources and you basically had to pick up the knowledge and move it someplace safe where whatever version of the Mongols were out there uh, couldn't get at them. James, you have a thought. Yeah, I was just wondering, because um, you asked how we were going with this concept. Now, what you've described very much sounds like the sort of organic spread driven by being a real honest exemplar, like you, the impact you make on people, people associate around you, you associate with them, da 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 da, da. Uh, But you've been talking about, or my understanding, you were talking about in light of coming social dislocation and unease. But that sort of organic spread as opposed to preachy or whatever you want to call it. Is it is that not the main way in any period of human history or the most desirable way in any period of human history might be? Probably not the way that it always has been. Um, yeah. I, I look at Sufis and you had various Sufi teachers, you know, like Rumi, for instance, you know, he was charismatic. He drew people around him. He left a legacy that is still existent today. Um, and you can say that about a lot of the teachers, but they were focused on one in individual and were and still are somewhat hierarchical. Okay. Um, Adrian, you got excited. Yeah. Uh, no, I got uh, I don't know what I mean. It's less known as the whole establishment of the tariqas in in the, in the east, but in Al Andalus, the the teaching was pretty much decentralized until they started to establish some tariqas, and Shadili yeah. and other tariqas, then then made into the 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 fabric of the of the teaching in Andalus, uh, Al Andalus. But if you read, for example, this uh, Memorial of the Saints, I, have, I don't know the name in, in English, this Ibn Arabi book yeah. where he describes all the teachers that were around his time and people that were around, they sometimes had a circle around them. Sometimes they didn't. Sometimes they were actual teachers with uh, some followers and, and a certain uh, transmission in a certain way, but most of the time, most of them, they were just um, teaching in their neighborhoods, and they, they, uh, and they would call not call themselves even teachers, right? So that uh, that idea of Sufi of the neighborhood that attracts me very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, that's Sufis. <laughs> Sorry. The, your friendly neighborhood Sufis. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so Nancy has a question. Rafiq says, yeah. though, yeah. before coming to today's meeting, I was thinking about that very same thing. How could I have a circle over here without a shape? And the answer is, build it from your own knowledge. Excellent. Yeah. Rafiq says, wonderful. I'm glad that yeah. resonates for you. Teach what you know. Don't teach what you don't know. Uh, and be open to learning from everybody who comes to you. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it goes without saying that, quote unquote, what you know is going to evolve over time and mature over time. If you let it, of yeah. course. And rely on your support systems. And this is one of your support systems, should you want it to be. And uh, so that is an important thing. Now, in the next few months, we're going to be creating these things for people to do. They're not the, the ongoing. We talk about whatever we want this week. It will be a series of courses that you can do on first how to learn this stuff in the right way, and then how to teach it. And that's important because, uh, as my teacher said, teaching is different than doing. Uh, there were two brothers who were both high-level martial artists in this system. And one of them was a better fighter. The other one was a better teacher. The guy who was the better teacher became the head of the system not the best fighter. Uh, and that is wise. Hmm. So more about that soon. I'd yes. like to touch base with Nancy, yes. who has her hand up. Uh, thanks. Um, I, well, I was thinking that in general, this is much more inspiring than frightening. Cool. Although, Although, you know, if I think more clearly about the details, it might get more frightening. Yeah. But I I will say that I'm seeing an era of intellectual and emotional corruption that I just find horrifying. Yeah. Welcome to the Mongol Invasions 3.0. Yeah, I don't know whether the Mongol Invasions had so much of a mental effect or if they were just killing people. But something like the Cultural Revolution, you know, that was, it was getting into people's minds. Yeah. And we also look at uh, the Khmer Rouge. Mm hmm Yeah. Which made the Cultural Revolution look like a picnic. Yeah. Adrian asks, how to manage unwanted attention? Uh, this is a problem. And one of the things we are going to be teaching is, as a teacher, how do you create rapport with your students? And how do you break rapport with your students? Um, both are necessary skills. Uh, More important, this is, this is going to be an interesting thing because one thing we know is that we need more women working as teachers. This has been for centuries, it's been a boys club and that has not worked as well as one would have hoped. It sucks. Yeah. And so uh, my desire is to create more women teachers than men teachers. God willing. God willing. It's hard. I mean, there's yeah. there's a lot of 
this is why it is both an inner and an outer thing, right? Because so many of us have internal programming getting in the way too, the way that we've been. Not for all of us, but for many of us, there's a cultural training that says, oh, this is not for you. This is not your job. So it is another layer of challenge and self-work to press back against that and see it for what it is. Nancy. Is that Nancy? Yeah, Nancy. That's Osama. Kabir or, or change name to Mercy. Um, <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Sorry, the text is small and far away from me. No worries. Osama um, Kabir. <laughs> one of the, the things that are really interesting to me is that this sentiment, well, two of them. Number one, that the, the whole idea of this hierarchy needs to change to the circle and number two we need more women teachers i'm hearing this in pretty much every circle that i go to from all of the people these you know the people who started these circles you're one of them there's this other turkish sufi teacher another turkish sufi and i'm like what like and I don't I don't think you guys know each other like no <laughs> you not, know like not on this not on this plane maybe on another plane we know each other right and it's such a such an interesting thing that even uh today I learned that what's the guy's name I don't know if I forgot his name but it's, you know some kind of scholar quote unquote big deal guy um who I wouldn't even think that he would say something like that he called it pre uh, i mean post post tariqa uh, you know we're going into a post tariqa um world i guess uh so it's it is interesting to me that in every circle the same sentiment is being like hey this is what needs to happen this is what needs to happen we need more more women as leaders and it also this idea of the the circle needs to take place. Yeah, yeah. And so we have always known that we need to transform with the times. And uh, we are in the third transformation now. First transformation was from. Ali through like Junaid and Halaj and all of those guys. Then you had the period where the tariqas formed as um, hierarchical systems around a given teacher who had a method. We're now getting into Sufism 2.5. Uh, and this is going to be a different thing, inshallah. It's interesting to hear. I mean, I'm not surprised about this. I've heard, you know, when I was in my 20s, I was part of certain. Uh, Heretical. I mean, sort of. Her yeah. I mean, like queer Muslim communities we and like heresy. Muslim spoken word collectives and things like that. And um, there was a lot of talk about challenging these things that are accepted as necessary and normal but that are tripping us up such as hierarchy such as gender exclusionism those are things that these spaces were able to challenge just by the nature of being what they were but for spaces where we're specifically carrying tradition forward it does mean looking back and saying what what should we keep and what should we change
I was talking about this with my friends, maybe directly it's from the part of a longer thread, it looks like. And the transmission of the Baraka. That was from yeah. Adrian. Yeah. The transition. Transmission. Transmission of the Baraka still happens. Right now, I can transmit the Baraka to anybody who wants it. And they don't have to join a social club. They don't have to follow me. They don't have to do anything. That is uh, joining the social club and following a particular teacher is how it was done in the old days. People can just receive it. Anybody who has reached the station where they have ijazah permission to do that um, can do it. And there is no requirement to put limitations on it. Nora can do that, but she's uh, pickier than I am. <laughs> she might actually um, have to sh show some gumption there. He's right about that. Yeah. So the Baraka is, is still there. It will never go away. Not till the end of the world. We will not lose it. And then... Now, how does how does that work in a circle setting where somebody might be listening to this or uh, who, myself, right? I want to start a circle. There is a circle, actually, right? Yeah. Um, however, as part of, quote unquote, formally being initiated and having that flame that that transmission of that baraka actually being quote unquote transmitted i've never i don't know so in a circle that i'm sitting with my friends how does that transmission of baraka go like in that scenario or anybody who's listening to this who is like oh, i don't um when you are ready and your heart is open to it, events will conspire for it to come to you. Once it comes to you, you become a catalyst, you become a seed, you become the, the leavening that goes into the dough that makes the bread rise. Um, so that's subtler then. Yeah. That's not like the obvious laying on of hands and then suddenly... You have the power. Yeah. I mean, it can look like that, but it doesn't have to. I think uh, sourdough bread is the perfect example of this. Sourdough bread is baked using what's called sourdough starter. Sourdough starter is a medium, a living medium that's kept in a jar and is fed sometimes daily. And it has been around. Uh, my mother had a sourdough starter that probably was 50 years old, at least. I like that. Did she name it? Uh, no, she never named it. I but, tried to start a sourdough once, and I did name it, but I did not keep it alive. Yeah, you have to bake all the time. That's the secret. <laughs> it wants to be used. It wants to be used. Yeah. But... That sourdough starter can make a billion loaves of bread and it splits, right? It grows to a certain uh, amount and then you have to cut it in half and then you feed one half and you can throw away the other or give away the other. And it's better to give it away. So you give somebody the sourdough starter that's been in your family for 200 years. Uh, so, yeah, this is an interesting it's analogy. an interesting analogy, yeah. Yeah, the sourdough starter is like the baraka, and it gets passed around. Let's see what else is going on in the chat. Okay. Anissa said, I was just about to ask that. About the baraka. And... Yeah, third right through dreams, that's something about a book. 
there's an ongoing conversation in the chat about a textbook or a book having to do with uh, the Third Reich and Nazism. Yeah, we won't worry about yeah, that. Yeah, that's yeah. And Carl is raising his hand, or he's chasing away the cat. One of the two. <laughs> Yes, I have a question, and that is, how specific of a teaching are we talking about here? Uh, on one hand, it sounded like you were going to provide like almost like a lesson plan. Uh, I'm not sure that's the right term, but the, uh, the on the other, it was, well, when you're ready, you'll start attracting people, and then you teach what you know. Both. That's my question is, what is this teaching? Well, for instance, we might do specific courses on how to use the Enneagram of process in your work. Uh, we might do courses on how to do the various parika breath practices and how to teach them. We might do um, courses on specific movement practices that one can do. It can be a lot of different things. I mean, look at the six years of material that we've done and imagine that for every theme there, um, we can do a course. And provide more structure, perhaps. Yeah, and provide, this is how you teach this. Not just, not just this is how you do it, but this is how you can share this with other people. Uh, one of the first ones we're going to do, and we're going to do this in the Digital Durga, is um, the Sufi method of reading sacred texts. Because we have a very specific method for doing that. And it produces profound understandings compared to just reading it like a comic book. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Adrian says the Noor Mushtaq University. That's what we've been doing. Just at this point, we're building the library. Yeah. Uh, I remember reading uh, Morris Nichols' books many years ago, and they have, and he's, the one thing I remember from them is he talked about being able to to read the Bible differently went from the perspective of uh, Gurdjieff's system, and it it's really it was really quite interesting. Now, I don't know whether that's the same thing that you're talking about, but it seems an, a, analogous. Yeah, it's analogous. Uh, our method is a Sufi method comes from the Turkish Sufis, who my theory is that they stole it from the Orthodox Christians uh, because there are so, so much similarity going on. The Sufi method is more oh. elaborate uh, and cooler. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it is a method of reading sacred texts that takes you into the mysteries of the text. So... There's lots of stuff like that. We, There is no end to the teaching. But we're going to start with the core materials. And the reading sacred, sacred text part is in case somebody wants to start a book club. If you want to, if you want to like get together and read Ibn Arabi and understand what the heck he's saying, we have a methodology for that. If you want to teach self-remembering and self-observation and self-witnessing, we have methodologies for that. Yeah, and this will require us to have discipline as well in terms yeah. of, I know, pull yourself together, man. I'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> We're going to have to, you know, get organized and make sure that we can uh, create program structures that are useful, meaningful, that get you where we and you want to go. So it's exciting for us as well. It's an exciting new level of challenge.
So more thoughts? It's time to do this. I think uh, one moment. Yeah, James has a thought. Go ahead, James. I might be backtracking a bit, but in terms of moving from a hierarchical to a circular network kind of system, would part of that be the willingness of the people who emerge or are put in place as any kind of authority, group leader, ever informal, to be now be more willing to take critical feedback, to be on less of a pillar? Uh, groups where whoever is coordinating, I mean, because a leader tends to emerge in some sense. But nowadays, there's a lot of talk about spiritual bypassing and distinguishing like remedial from generative work and so forth. And the great problem in the past, it seems to me, is when the uh, people in a position of influence can't accept feedback and maybe even lack basic self-insight, is that our increased willingness to talk about such things, to me that would be a crucial part of the circle, circular horizontal networks developing. Yeah. Is that fair? And this is an example of that. If you guys uh, were hanging out with one of these high control gurus, you would be constantly getting pushed down because you're all smart and you all think for yourselves and you are used to having the space for your own thoughts. Uh, and so part of what we're doing with the nine sided circle is we are demonstrating how this can be done. And each and every one of you uh, who shows up here on Sunday nights is part of that demonstration. Because yes, Noor and I are the leaders in that sense, but as uh, the members of the world government said to Mr. Gurdjieff, or world government, world whatever it was, the World Brotherhood, that's what he called it. We find that the teacher and student, so-called, create the teaching together. And that's what we do here. And if you look at our videos, uh, you'll see that the teaching comes out through the discussion and interaction of an intelligent, well-informed group. Don't let it go to your head, but that's your guys. <laughs> and so, believe it or not, you have been helping us model what a circle in the 21st century could look like. I'd like to read Anissa's yes. remark. She said, we're all in this together. Maybe we can help with whatever with whatever way we can too, to make the process easier on both of you. I very much appreciate Anissa. I hope you guys know that you already contribute immensely and help us out a lot. But and we'll take more help. Yes, it's likely that there will be times when we reach out for help that we want feedback on specific projects on how we can improve them or what's missing or what would you like to see, all of those things. and. In the midst of those projects, we may need specialized help. Each of you have some pretty amazing skills to offer. And from time to time, <laughs> we may need to to uh, utilize you. Yeah, and it may just be that some of you want to paint yourself yellow, get yourself a pair of overalls, and be our minions. <laughs> that would be cool. <laughs> so we'll see. we'll see what we need. And we will put it out there But uh, as those things arise. Be prepared, Anissa, to uh, hear from us about this. Alka has something to say. Finally, Alka was... speaks. <laughs> so one of the things uh, when I'm listening to this is um, coming to my mind, 
I am, I don't even know the first letter of Muslim um, or a religion. Does it have, like, do I have to be, um, no. do I have to know the Muslim culture? Nope. Okay. Nope, 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 nope. Uh, you that part, maybe but, notice yeah. that when you and I talk, I don't talk Muslim. I talk Hindu all the time. Yes, the and time. and for past two years, you, I, I'm speechless when it comes to. You've made it so easy for me to walk on this path. Uh, and, and for me, it's really just happening, and I just landed in your circle. But when I'm around, there's a lot of um, Muslim words which I don't understand, but I understand the essence of what you guys are talking. Um, so that was my concern. Thank yeah. You. And it's a good question. It's a good question. And it helps to know some, some of the Arabic words. But we have three languages that we have to know something about. Arabic, Turkish, and Farsi. Wow, English. Yeah, that's, English. <laughs> nobody needs to know English. It's we work in English primarily, yeah. so it is a door that can be open or closed, and we try to do the best we can to. Yeah, but keep the, the door old open. technical language from the sources that we draw from are usually in those three languages. Fair enough. Yes. And we are yeah, and blessed to have Arabs, Turks, and Persians in the group that will help us with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it helps me because my grandparents and parents are from that part of India, which is now Pakistan. Mm. And they used to speak a lot of Urdu. So like when you say ish or Mahabad or so many yeah. other words when you say it. it it's yeah, Urdu is basically Persian light. <laughs> Uh, so, so I understand. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Anka. Now, uh, Ian has something to say? Yeah, I was just going to comment that there's a part of this that suddenly become particularly interesting to me um, because my long-term teacher uh, started out with from a Hindu tradition of uh, gurus and the like. And when he came to the West, he brought a whole lot of Hindu baggage with him. And I say Hindu baggage because in retrospect, it was really unhelpful. One of the things I most respect about him is that over the years, he's removed all of that Hindu baggage. There's now no religion stuff. There's no philosophy. And yet the core practice is still exactly the same and he just talks of it now in terms of it, finding inner peace well and and other things like waking up and things that would be familiar here but it's been very interesting to me to watch that and uh, the fact that he was able to do that is one of the reasons i respect him in particular so that's that's something that if you can manage to think through what are the core aspects and messages of this without necessarily involving uh, the history and cultural aspects, uh, and I, I suspect that is much more difficult to do in, in this context, but I think it's something that would be quite remarkable. Yeah, and the thing is, the work is science. It's not religion. Exactly. And so for me, it's easy. If I talk with Alka or any of my other uh, students from India, I can put the teaching in a Hindu context, mostly in a yoga context, because... It's the same. It's not different. If I talk with Christian friends, I can put it in a Christian context. Because as our sheikh said once, Jesus taught Sufism to everybody. 
I'm still working on that, but I do find, you know, with people I know, friends, peers who are not into Sufism or religion in general or philosophy, it's an interesting puzzle figuring out ways to communicate to yeah. them. The and with my atheist friends, about. I talk biology, I talk neurology, I talk yeah, exactly. uh, that yeah. sort of thing, because it's all the same. Right. Yep. Yeah, there's there, there's there's one other thing that uh, I remember him saying uh, fairly recently, which is that he talked, although it actually was quite a few years ago now, but he talked about how it was important for every person to come to evaluate the truth of what he was teaching is for themselves and to not rely on the fact that there was a whole lineage behind this and and you know all sorts of saints had said this is true and so on but coming to make that evaluation for yourself was the most important thing. Yeah, absolutely. And we run across that from time to time. I I will get, people will send me emails and messages asking like, what is your lineage? And it's like, we have a lineage. We can trace our lineage in an unbroken line back to the prophet. And we have Ijazah. I have this beautiful piece of paper with roses on it and everything from my shape that says, I have permission to do all of this stuff. And you know what? She has the same thing. But uh, Well, for a long time, we refused to talk about it. Yeah. and, and we But we have talked about it a little bit. But the it, thing is, yeah. it means exactly jack shit. Your lineage and your pieces of paper mean nothing. They mean less than nothing. The only thing that matters is your own behavior and what you can do. And this this freaks people out sometimes because I'll have somebody come to me and say, well, Baba, what's his Nanda said this, that, and the other thing. And I'm like, so? Because we, we have been taught through our lineage, we do not defer. And that's scary to a lot of people. I don't care what any great sheikh has said. You know, sheikh, what's his name, who is the Qutub al-Zaman, according to all of his students. I don't care what he says. But and I think that's what I love about your teaching. Yeah, and I don't expect you guys to care what we say other than to evaluate it for what's useful to you. Yeah. Whitney says, verify for yourself. Yes. Yeah. Now, along with oh. this, within the nine-sided circle, there is Artarika. And you've heard us mention the digital Durga. And that's where we teach... Sufism as Sufism, for those people who have a desire to learn that. But it, even then, it's not old school Sufism, uh, nor is not the Sheikh, and we all have, I mean, she loves it when I kiss her hand, but. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's no, you know, you don't have to put the teacher on a pedestal, that kind of thing. No. My balance is not that good anymore. Put me <laughs> on a pedestal, I will fall off, hurt myself. It would be sad. <laughs> Mustak, for me, what I love about this community that you have created, it's like for me, it just happening. I have not reading any scriptures or anything. It's when I cannot read the signs, I can come to your 
community and you have this non-religion way of bringing me out of that rabbit hole and putting me back on that path. So that's what I am learning from this community. And, and I would really like to learn what you have to teach. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, you poor devil, you are learning. You're in it already. Yeah. Up to your eyeballs. All right. So let's catch up with the chat. Okay. Catch up with the chat. All right. So Nancy was saying, I was thinking this sounds like more work than the two of you can do. You'll need minions. This is back to our minion discussion. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true. We, we have grown beyond what we can do, just the two of us. Ah. And, yeah. So... We're just waiting for for God to hire more people. <laughs> so then Anissa said uh, about the terminologies, as, as Ian was saying, she's referencing what Ian was saying about terminologies. And she said, the names may change, but the core is the same universally. Yep. And Mercy... Osama says this I still like Osama Kamiya. <laughs> this tension between the universal and the particular is a very interesting topic to me. Is that tension always present? Um yes, but it's a dynamic tension. It is uh Buckminster Fuller talked about this tensegrity. Tensegrity is uh, a way of creating shapes. So you have bricks and you stack them on top of each other and the pressure goes down and down and down. And the, the bricks at the bottom have more pressure than the bricks at the top. A tensegrity structure um, spreads the pressure out through all of its members through uh, tension and compression uh, sections distribution yeah this distributes the tension so if you if you press on the top of a tensegrity structure the whole structure absorbs the pressure as opposed to on a stack of bricks where the bottom bricks end up getting broken fuller was an interesting guy i love his work so in terms of the concepts and terminologies and stuff one way to think about that is that context can offer insights. We don't need to necessarily be attached to vocabularies and traditions and stuff, but I do think that there are glimmers of the kind of wisdom we're trying to achieve in generalities and universalities, universalities that can, for some people, in some moments, appear through particulars. Because different things speak to different people in different ways at different times. And there is always creativity and skill in finding the right words for the right moment for the person in front of you. All right. Whitney mentions that this is the cosmic struggle. <laughs> yeah. All right. What else? Verify for yourself. And that's it. Me. That's it. That's where that's we're it. at now. Cool. Yeah. Uh, okay. Any other thoughts? Questions? Answers? Judgments? Yeah. We can take a judgment or two. Sheree. Shree's been very quiet. I enjoy listening because I'm in the same boat as Alka. This is not my familiar territory. And so coming, just turning up for nearly five six and a half years. Yeah, I'm nearly six years. So coming up, I just started after you just began. So I'm still a baby 
but I really appreciate that you commented in that you use the language that the person your is who is your audience, whoever person that you're talking to, you're using what they're familiar with to bring them to that universal wisdom. And that's that's basically why I'm here, because I can see it, I can feel it, I'm witnessing it, and and trying to apply that in my own life, that awareness of who I'm with and how I'm impacting on them and using the language that can reach them better, even if I might not agree with that particular philosophy. I've noticed that it's it's using the right language and you guys do that. And so you impart this teaching so well and it's something that I try and make a commitment to try and come to at least this because this is been so useful to me. Thank you. Thanks, Sheree. And it's creative work. I think for anyone who's in a position of trying to share knowledge or or wisdom, so to speak, and really connect with people, it's a constant process of learning new ways to express these same concepts so that they can resonate, so that they feel real and aren't just theoretical or or nonsense terminologies and concepts. And it just happens that our audience is so diverse that we have to stay on our toes. Yeah. So this is the secret of the nine-sided circle. This has been our intention from the beginning is to create this umbrella under which people can learn and help others learn. And you will all be receiving your draft notices shortly. (laughs) Ah. Well, thanks for sitting in, guys. We really appreciate it. Have we, uh, is there anyone we have not had the chance to hear from? Uh, I don't know. Let me see. Yeah. Um, I just want to say, sure. Yes. Um, You know, and when uh, trying to explain like complex ideas or concepts, um, Mushtaq gave a fantastic piece of advice in don't give them too much (laughs) because by giving them too much, oftentimes you can just confuse them or scare them away. Um, And so that's been a very um, useful piece of advice for me. So thanks for that. Absolutely. Let me see. Kristen, do you have any more thoughts? You've been so quiet tonight. Um, not sure I have uh, much to say right now. Yeah, just enjoying the conversation and uh, the points that you brought up. And, and I don't think I really have anything to add right now, but but thank you for asking. Okay. Thanks, Christian. All right, then. Shall we go to Brady Bunch mode? Let's go to Brady Bunch mode. So... In conclusion, I will say, look forward to interesting things happening in the next six years. Mm-hmm. Yep. And for those of you who have expressed interest, you will be hearing from me in this next week. Be prepared. <laughs> it sounds ominous. Yes. <laughs> Um, all right, everyone. So, ah, thank you so much. I am going to be traveling, so it remains to be seen how much I will be able to uh, be present over the next couple weeks or so. Don't expect her (laughs) to be here. She's going to a wedding where she is the maid of honor and then seeing family and all of this. I don't expect to see her for two and a half weeks. I'll be lucky if I get an email. All right. Well, we can... uh... 
we can wave to each other and everyone watching on YouTube and we'll see you next time. Take care. Take care. Bye.